Welcome to episode 178 of Wealth Talk. My name is Christian Rodwell, the Membership Director for Wealth Builders, and I'm joined today by our founder, Mr. Kevin Whelan. Hello, Kevin. Hello. Good, good to be with you again on this festive day. Yes, it is indeed. Only well, less than two weeks until Christmas now, and this will be our last podcast episode of 2022. You made me panic me there. You, I thought you were going to say this is our last podcast ever. No way. Don't make me nervous, Chris. Come on. <laughs> not at all. I think we're nearly at our four-year anniversary, which will be early next year. So no, we're not stopping anytime soon. And uh, once again, thank you to everyone listening who has supported us throughout this year and left us very kind feedback, reviews and comments. We really, really appreciate it. And by it. the way, it is Christmas. It is a season of goodwill. If you've been enjoying the podcast, and I meet people, you know, and they say, I'm loving the podcast, so wait, where's my review? You know, so take the time, just do a little review. If you like it, if you don't like it, tell us personally, and we'll change it for you. Um, but if you are liking the content, the challenge with it, of course, Chris, it's a bit of a random walk around the whole wealth story, which means you can't use the podcast as a strategic way to build your wealth, but it is a kind of an inter... A nice little interlude, isn't it, from time to time, just to see what the old geezer and the young geezer are talking about, and if they've got any guests worth listening to. Today, <laughs> it's just the ramblings of an old man. Oh, well, hopefully a little bit more than that. I know we often get feedback saying, you know, absolutely loving the podcast, been binging it, and I've been executing everything that you guys are talking about. So, so hopefully we're uh, spreading a little bit of uh, magic dust out there to help people build more wealth. But today we are talking about keeping it in the family. Yeah. And um, yeah, we're just going to have a little discussion and it's kind of a bit of a prelude because we've talked about Wealth Builders for Families, but we are ever so close now to uh, having that program ready and that will be delivered uh, early part of next year. Mm. Well, look, it's a, we all know this is the time, you know, for being with families. And interestingly enough, you know, I'm going to be a granddad for the second time and my middle son is... Just um, popped the question in New York, so uh, he'll be arriving anytime soon, actually. So that's all good news, and, and it's wonderful, isn't it, when you're, your family are changing and growing around you. But it made me think, and I posted recently, Chris, about you know the, the real challenge for our young people, the real mix, almost like a deathly mix of, of things that are working against them to create their wealth and you know consider myself fortunate as a baby boomer that many things were kind of lined up to help us you know um across the piece you know big final salary schemes for many jobs for life to create that security you know all of those things were there not that i followed that path of course i didn't but but for many people they became financially secure and maybe even independent without having to do much, without having to learn much, without having to participate much in their own wealth building journey. That can't be the case now. You know, so I want to dive into those things a bit to try and help parents think. Because the big challenge is if the the all the deck is stacked up against our younger people, and we'll talk about that, who's going to unstack the deck? You know, in the end, does it end up being bank of mum and dad? Do we always come to the rescue with the bank account? You know, or is, are there other alternatives? And I want to advocate that there are some lessons to be learned, some myths to be dispelled. And I want to almost unwave a magic wand, if you like, to dispel myths that really make my blood boil yeah. and help parents to learn what to do to be a good steward for the next generation rather than let the kids learn the lessons that they perhaps didn't learn because they didn't need to learn them yeah so uh, maybe we can dive into that so it's always a uh, it's always interesting dispelling myths and, and kind of working out how how did that even get to be accepted as a home truth when in fact it's an old wives tale uh so let's get into that chris yeah and of course in the last 10 years the onset of social media which has a double-edged sword. There's obviously great aspects to that in terms of being able to spread uh, information much yeah. more freely and easily. But of course, not all of that information is correct. And so the younger generation, they're going to pick it up from somewhere, right? And uh, often they might be picking up things which, as you say, are more myths and actually not backed by solid 
principles? Well, yeah, and that's that's a great point, Chris, because at Wealth Builders, you know, I do my best to work on principles. I don't try and give opinions. I'm not trying to be controversial from an opinions point of view. Um, I'm willing to be, you know, willing to discuss it with anybody who's got a different view. But um, but I think the, the the problem with social media for me is not that the myths get compounded, which they do, but it's the fact that we're we're living in comparison economics now. So it's so easy to see the apparent success of people when you're comparing yourself to other people. And that comparison leads to many psychological actions. And we see it in our wealth builder journey, Chris. We see some people start the journey and others get a quick start. You know, they find a, an easy um, strategy that works for them. It clicks pretty much straight away. And those people who click straight away, they're posting, aren't they? They're saying, this is my next property. This is my next business. This is my next investment. You know, they're doing things. And some people who aren't getting there as quickly feel bad. There's an emotion attached to, to that journey. And, and, you know, we try and help that by having coaching calls every single month um, and encouraging people to show up because the wealth building journey is not one that you can follow with milestones that just simply roll on. You know, you sometimes you've got to wait. And particularly at the beginning in your, in your wealth journey, you've got to wait many months at the beginning because you're learning things, you're discovering things. You know, you've got to get to a place where you can find your flow. Uh, and for many of us, we've been educated out of our flow. So in other words, you know, there, there's a absolutely fantastic TED Talk. You know, I could not rave enough about it. Maybe you could put a link to it in the show notes, Chris which is Sir Ken Robinson. I mean, it's probably the most listened to TED Talk almost in, in history, I think. Oh, man, it's amazing. And the principle of the lesson in the TED Talk is that the school system has educated the creativity out of our kids. In other words, creativity isn't valued highly, but wealth building is about creativity. And I think what happens then is when the lack of creativity occurs and the old wives' tales set in, people start to believe, I can't. I'm too old. I'm too young. I haven't got enough money to get started. I haven't got enough time to get started. You've, you and I have heard this thousands and thousands of times. And all of them are a fallacy because wealth building is about taking small, consistent steps every single month that's all you have to do and everybody can make one step and if you can make one step you can make a second step but hey i'm not going to go down that path today i want to get to the myths chris right because it's the myths that uh just seem to get accepted as you know this is true and it's absolutely not true okay right where should we begin then well i think we should begin with the idea that, well, for example, let's begin with the idea that, you know, you should uh, buy and hold money in the stock market to retire, right? So this whole idea of saving money as soon as you can to build a nest egg to then draw an income in retirement is a complete myth because it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because there's no responsibility, no creativity, no participation by anybody on that journey. The only thing that's happening is a product has been created, the product has been sold, and the product is perpetuated in fees that keeps a hugely profitable financial industry. It's an industry. It's huge. Uh, that perpetuates this myth that you should just you buy and hold diversified stocks and, and hope for the best. It's kind of, they call it the buy and hold strategy. And I think it would be better named as the, the buy, hold and hope strategy. Because the challenge is you can't wait till you build a pot. Because when you get a pot, let's say you've got a reasonable pot. You know, most people don't get more than a quarter of a million. 
because they start later. Our younger people are starting work later. You know, historically, getting a university degree was a guarantee of a job. Now it isn't. You need an MA. And then, you know, you're one in 50 people trying to get the same job. So while there's a shortage of, of jobs, there are still a dearth of jobs for, for our graduates. You know, so it's getting tougher and tougher and tougher. And then there's the student debt. You know, so I went to university, didn't pay for it. Um, and, and consequently, that was not a handbrake on my wealth, if you see what I mean. I didn't have to make those payments. But of course, student debt is part of life now. And often people coming out of university with 50 grand in debt. So that's a lead weight around your a shackle, isn't it, around your leg before you even get started. And then what do you do? You, you, you're not, you're joining a, you do get a job and then you put some money in a pension. You don't know why, you're just told you do. So you put some money in and you just default your way into putting money into a pot. You have no idea of what it's doing. You've got no idea how to make it improve. You've got no creativity of your own in play. And then you move to another job in the future. And then you leave these disparate pots. Maybe sometimes you might consolidate them. But the same problem exists that it's a challenge to build that pot. And increasingly, you know, the participation rates, in other words, the number of young people who are actually participating in the pensions getting less. And that's one of the reasons why the government's forced it. They've forced the hand of the employee to actually pay into their own pension. And, and then they think, oh, well, the government's paying or the government's encouraging me. The, my employer's paying a bit and I'm paying a bit. I should be all right. But they don't do the maths. So, you know, you save your way, you get to a, a decent sum, call it half a million just for a number, which is a big number for most people. Well, what, 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 what then? Right. So you, you get to 60 and you got half a million quid. Now, by the way, uh, I'm ranting, I know, but hey, you know, hopefully you can draw the threads of this together. Uh, what do you reckon the average age of first time buyer is now, Chris? Well, late 30s, I would guess. Yeah, 37. So, so the average age first time buyer is 37. Right. Cross the living crisis, interest rates high. What do you think they're going to do with their mortgage? Are they going to go 20 years? I'm going to go, Kev, you've written a book called Save a Fortune, how to completely eliminate your mortgage fast, right? I paid mine off in seven. Are they going to pay their mortgage off in seven? No. They're going to take on their mortgage 30 years, 40 years, right? So they're still going to be paying a mortgage in their 70s, right? Most. Now, what can they do about that? Well, it's, it's, it's difficult unless you're thinking through the cost of this. And then, you, okay, so you pay your mortgage off at 60, say, and then you, so you've got, you don't have that expense, and then you've got a pot of half a million quid. And then all of your life then, you've been working hard, you get to 60, and you've now got to create a life of certainty from an asset that's fundamentally uncertain. Right, because is the stock market certain? No. Does it give us a predictable income? It no. doesn't. You know, you're investing in companies, but most people are investing in default funds. And for many of them, those funds switch to cash as they get older for for the for the reason that they were built, the products, you know, this is the thing more often than not, these are products built for compliance and for profit not to try and help people build their wealth. So I think there's a misalignment between the objectives of the people selling or putting together this to make a wealthy profit, getting paid year in, year out, year in, year out, whether the market goes up or down, you know, and always getting paid before you get paid. It's, it's just a tragic waste of an understanding. And more often than not, the advisors will say, you know, you've got half a million quid, you've done well, uh, you get 4% on your money. But it isn't 4% on the money. It's they suggest you take 4%, 20 grand, right? Half a million gives you 20 grand. Well, that's not a lifestyle that for many would be a worthwhile aspiration. More often than not, it's a cut dramatically in income. And but it's not a 4% guarantee. It's well, what if you get a stock market crash? 
How do you recover from that? If you get a 50% stock market crash, you need 100% on your money just to get back to where you were before. Uh, so there's no magical compounding. There's no risk mitigation. So as a consequence, I think most people live a life of scarcity and uncertainty. And, and I think that's a tragedy. And, and I would like to do my best to help people understand that and to not fall into that trap, not fall into the myth that says you should buy and hold and wait and everything's going to be okay because it isn't. Because the big robber here is not the financial fees, although that's, don't get me on that soapbox on the fees, um, the big robber is the creativity. So when, when younger people don't participate in their own wealth, they don't learn anything, and all of that wasted education, all of that potential knowledge that's created around them is not shared because most parents are following an old imprint. They're following the final salary imprint. They're following the imprint of the past, and they're not equipping their children uh, of all ages, You know whether they're 8 or 28. And not equipping them with the skills. So what I'd like to do is encourage parents to 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 secure their own oxygen mask first, sure, but then to help their kids or be prepared to think about how they could help them. And uh, and wealth builders for families will be deliberately designed to to cater for parents who've got children of any age, um, including oldies like me with you know kids getting married and kids having babies, you know, and. And so I'll, I'll give you a, a breather to, to interject with my ramblings, but you, you get the point, Chris. It's just, it's not stacked up for wealth at the moment. Yeah, no, I'll let you pause and uh, take a sip. But um, I mean, it's a controversial view, right, that you make there about the stock market. So um, there will possibly be listeners now who say, well, I've invested in the markets, you know, it's done me well and I've built wealth through the market. So yeah. we talk about diversification, Wealth Builders is built on the seven pillars principle there, that there are seven different asset classes, investments being one of those. So where do investments sit? They do have a place in wealth building. They, they do have a place, but I'm saying, Chris, so I thank you, thank you for the, the sort of mediation of my tone there, but it, it's not about me saying the stock market doesn't have a place. I mean, look, you think about what the stock market is. It's a marketplace where businesses offer you a share in the value of their company. Now, historically, I mean, that, that came from the industrial age, you know, so there's a massive movement in wealth in terms of epochal changes, you know, things that fundamentally shift, an epoch, uh, an era, a complete change from landed gentry to industrialists. And that's what happened, you know, and the UK were a powerhouse for that. And then uh, there was a transition from industrialists to shareholders. And we became a nation of shareholders and homeowners. And I think that's great. And I genuinely do think the stock market originally uh, was, was fantastic because it gave you a share of value. So you could look at companies and say, I like what that company does. And um, I'd like to participate in its value. And of course, if you choose well and you choose diversely, there's nothing wrong with the principle of buying and valuable companies. I mean, that's what Warren Buffett does. And his entire business is based on that philosophy. However, most people don't buy for value. They buy in default funds. They buy into funds that they don't know what's going on. They didn't choose the company. They didn't choose the, the dividend. They didn't choose anything in particular. They didn't choose something that was aligned with their own personal preferences, whether they were in favor of environmental friendly things, whether they were in favor of green energy, whether they're in favor of electric cars, nobody's investing or very few people are investing in line with their principles. They're in, they're investing in line with a default view where that view is being created by somebody else for, for making profit. Okay. So, so, so I think, you know, it's not that the stock market is bad, but historically, Chris, you know, there was an epochal change there as well. Originally, you know, lots of changes that, that people may not know about, but, you know, we moved, look, two, two massive ones fundamentally, uh, big stuff, but maybe isn't thought about. Number one, we came off the gold stand in the 70s, okay, when our currency was linked to the amount of gold that we had. As soon as you move from gold back, 
uh, to fiat currency, then everything is about sentiment. Everything is about quantitative easing. You know, we have no control over the value of our money. And we saw that massively, didn't we? In recent political uncertainties, we saw the pound plummet. Um, now, when the pound plummets, that affects the buying power of your money, um, not just in the UK, but abroad. Well, if you think about retirement as a journey where the destination is retirement land, and then you need a currency to buy your life beyond that, nobody knows their exchange rate. They don't know how much am I going to get for the money I've saved in my pension because there's no link to value anymore. It's all linked to sentiment. So sentiment drives everything now. So fiat currency, sentiment, shares now on sentiment. It used to be a share was share of value. Now it's just a share price. And the price becomes everything. So I think um, investment in the stock market can be done, but can be done well. And it can be done by understanding that income can flow from investments in the stock market if you choose the stock as well. It also means you can put in risk mitigation techniques because the other myth then in the stock market is just, just hold on, you know, just roll the dice. Well, I don't know about you, Chris, but, you know, as soon as you use the word roll the dice, go again, you know, roll your gains, there's no compounding then taking place because you can lose as quickly as you can gain. So where you can only compound when something adds on top of something else. So I hear people saying, well, I invest in the stock market because it compounds over time. No, it doesn't. Things only compound if they add value upon value upon value upon value. So the, the concept of compound interest I get because you earn interest, you don't lose the interest, you earn interest. You don't lose the interest, you earn more interest. That's compound interest. There's no compounding in the stock market. The only compounding going on, frankly, in the stock market is the compounding of the fees being charged, which are paid year in, year out, year in, year out, irrespective of whether the market works or not. So I think there's a, there's a gap in knowledge that we're trying to bridge and get people to participate in the stock market for sure, but to do it in line with their own DNA, with who they are as a person, who's their wealth dynamic, what do they feel, where is value coming in the world? We, we, we saw you interviewed Andrew Craig recently, did you not? Yes, that's right, yes. And, and he had a, a view, and that's an interesting view. I'm not saying it's, a, it's the right or wrong view for anybody, but it's a view. You know, invest in the whole world, for one. Uh, he's got a big view about biotech, and that it's, in the end... What comes to our rescue is the creativity of people, you know, finding solutions to things. So, so this circles me back exactly to Ken Robinson, which is creativity, Chris, has been educated out of us all. We don't want to be wrong, you know, so therefore we take solace in the old wives' tales that we've been told are true when in fact are untrue. And I want to bring creativity back into wealth building creativity of the parents showing not teaching because look what you know why don't they teach us at school why because the teachers haven't learned that lesson you know they're still part of the old pattern aren't they no disrespect intended to teachers you know i don't disrespect anybody for the career choice they make but a teacher is not living a program of building wealth in the stock market they're living a program of a final salary pension and that's great, you know, because that can give you security. But it, the kids are not going to be teachers. So the teachers are not well equipped because they haven't learned the lesson of the difference between trading time for money and a pension and building wealth through creativity and building wealth through the ownership of assets. So the best people to teach are the parents. But often the parents need to learn some new lessons. And part of the whole wealth builder philosophy for new lessons, Chris, is to get the parents to begin to think about a new epoch for themselves, a new chapter for themselves. So in stage one of the Wealth Builder Journey and Academy, tell people what we do, Chris, as far as the family wealth name is concerned. Yes, so we get people thinking about their family wealth name, their family wealth business. And that includes really sitting down with everybody around the table and discussing names that are meaningful, memories, 
and creating a logo, creating a name that everyone is involved in. And, and we've seen such an array from children's handprints to the family dog, uh, you know, in coats of arms and all sorts of, of wonderful logos there. Um, but it really brings it to life. It, you know, it makes it something that everybody's connected to and uh, meaningful. And, uh, and that's what drives it on and, and really creating that legacy. Yeah. So if, if you as a parent, you know, if you're, you're listening now, then you've got the chance to be a pioneer of a new generation of wealthy people in your family. And I mean this in the spirit of wealth, true wealth, which is, uh, you know, responsible, uh, mature, uh, sharing, giving, uh, all of those emotions, all of those, those uh, very important uh, qualities that are needed. It's not selfishness, it's selflessness. It's how do you create more value for others? And this is all part of the Wealth Builder principles. The Declaration of Independence, for example, uh, encapsulates those. So we want to try and lead that thought process of creating the family wealth business and then creating the concept of stewardship. Because stewardship is the opposite of selfishness. Stewardship says, I don't own this. I'm just taking care of it for the next generation. That's stewardship. It means you believe that your role is not selfish wealth. Uh, that's another one. I won't get into that biblical one, but money is the root of all evil. Well, we've heard that one before, right? Uh, and of course, that wasn't what was said by Paul. It was money or the love of money is the root of all evil. But money is just an idea, and an idea is a representation of you. So if you had more money, you'd be the same person. So, you know, all money is is just, just an idea. So let's take the idea and say, well, how do we build a fantastic family experience? And how do we build a, a principle of giving and sharing and growing and involving our children at whatever age they are so they can participate in seeing things and you can learn some new things about how you could do that so that in the future, whatever you call your family wealth business, and the, I just love the names and I just love how they come up with them. Um, it's wonderful. I was talking to a guy just a couple of days ago and uh, talking about this very concept. And I said, and I'd like you to think about it. He said, I've got it already. I said, what do you mean you got it already? And it was a New Zealand, I can't remember the name now, but it was, he's a Kiwi guy. And uh, the name was just instantly there, and it meant good fortune. You know, it's a, a key, whatever it is. I can't remember the name exactly, but that was his name, not my name, right? So, so you know, mine's Wealth Builders Together with the clasping hands, the five clasping hands around the outside of the, the circle. And, and, and yours being Rod Wellbeing, right? So all of, all of these things are, are deeply personal and not for judgment, but the benefit there is you're creating the stewardship idea. So do you want to, should we go for another myth? Okay. Am I, am I all right? I think I'm ranting a bit today. <laughs> Let's squeeze one more in then. Yeah. One more in. Yeah. Uh, well, look, increasingly we're seeing the biggest growth in the bank. There's a new bank in the UK. It's rapidly approaching huge status. And it's the bank of mum and dad. And the bank of mum and dad are coming to the rescue in all sorts of ways as the baby boomers who've got some wealth uh, pass some of that on. But, but I think there's a, there's a principle here, and it's an interesting one. It's going to be a controversial one, Chris, so I make no apology for this one. Often when we talk about the legacy, and I'll, I'll write a piece about the bank of mum and dad, okay, and, and what you can do about it and how you can uh, be a bank and be it well, but it all comes from the point of stewardship. So whether you provide money while you're alive, most people don't. They provide money when they pass. And without the use of trusts and without the use of wisdom, money gets distributed and then money gets dispelled and then the value gets destroyed. That's what happens. It's built in to the very fabric of pretty much all the major Western economies. In other words, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations, clogs to clogs in three generations. Somebody wise builds the money, the next generation enjoy the money and the next ones don't see any link between how the money was created or the values that were used to create it. 
and the money gets completely used up, consumed. And, and I think that's a principle that's not correct. I think a better principle to think about anyway is to think about, it's not what you leave your kids, what you leave within them. It's principles of teachings. It's principles of values that if you can teach them wise things and say we're building a stewardship fund in Rod Wellbeing, in Wealth Builders Together, in Waymari, it might be even, I think, the name. But whatever the name was, it's your family crest, your family name. And you're building that not to support just you, not to support your direct kids, but the kids of the kids and the kids of the kids and the kids of the kids. In other words, like the big families did in America, the Rockefellers, for example, you create a, an institutional process now. And it doesn't have to be massive, it doesn't have to be multi, multi, multi millions. It can be hundreds of thousands. And most people have got that now just with property values. That the, the wealth can be protected through the use of trusts and then rules in, of engagement, which I call a family charter. And we can help you write a family charter. And that charter will set the rules where those rules allow money to be given. Right? So, for example, money on weddings, money on babies. We buy a new car for anyone who's got a baby because they always need that extra space in there and so on. Um, uh, anyway, you create your own rules, give you some guidance on that. But in addition to that, it's also about giving back. So if you want to set up a business, you can borrow the money from the trust to set the business up, but you pay back. So it's not a gift. It's, it's an endowment of you know, the values. And, and that's what I think is critical. That's what I think should be done. And the myth then of just leaving a great legacy, what does that mean? Uh, I think leaving a great stewardship is a much better concept. So anyway, spirit of goodwill and all that, Chris. Um, I'm looking forward to the festive period. Um, I know that uh, you haven't got a massive family. So how, where are you sharing your Christmas this year? Um, I'm actually doing some volunteering on Christmas Day. So I'll be uh, helping people enjoy their family Christmas. Well, not a family, but those without a family having well, a yeah. Christmas well, lunch. I, 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 I applaud you for that. And, uh, and uh, you know, that, that, that again shows such, uh, some great values, giving of yourself. And um, hopefully you have a great one. And let's wish all of our listeners a fantastic uh, festive period as well, wherever they are in the, in the world. And uh, whatever their religion. So I hope you just enjoy the celebrations and uh, we'll be back with a bang in 2023 for 179. Yeah, we'll take a couple of weeks off over Christmas to uh, just enjoy ourselves, recharge the batteries. And uh, we advise that you will do the same too. So once again, thank you so much for your support, for your ears this year listening to us. And we very much look forward to continuing the journey with you in 2023. Kevin, we'll be back. Same time, same place next year. Until 2023, my friend. See ya.